Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here this morning. We thank you for you allowing us to gather together once again and to uh, just be here to love and honor and adore you. And Father, we just pray that you'll be with us this morning, that you'll inhabit the service with us. That uh, Father, everything we do and say would be pleasing in your sight. We pray all this in your Son's name. Amen. Please stand. <laughs>
21. Um, if you all turn to Matthew 6 for me. We're going to do this as a group also. Okay. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do charitable, charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before, before you as hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, and that they may have glory for men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have, the, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your char charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And I want you all to go with me on this one. With our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of the daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debts. And do not lead us into temptation. Kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For you, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive the men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Thank you.
song raises is, is it well with your soul? I mean, are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you, everything is good that you're ready to come to the table and partake? Scripture tells us is that we don't want to take it unworthily. We don't want to take it wrong. We want to take it as we're prepared to take it. We have to get our minds and our lives ready for that moment. I tell you all the time that it starts for me on a, on Saturday night. Saturday night I start I start preparing and doing different things. Last night I watched a TV show with Jesse until I don't know ten o'clock or so, and then he's like, "What are you going to do?" I said, "Well, I got to go over my." A sermon stuff. He said, okay. And he takes off so that I can go over the sermon stuff and get ready. And, and I start thinking then about this moment here. This moment that if we do nothing else today, we know that we've been in church. We know that we came and that we got ourselves fortified, re-energized, ready to face the rest of the week because we're going to take in Jesus. Because we're going to allow Him to become a physical part of us. The cup, the bread, represent his, his body and His blood. and It was broken. It was given for us. I mean, that act of dying on the cross and everything, I mean, it was personal. It was done for me. I always look at it that way. Me. He hung there because of me, because of my sins. And he did it so that I might have the hope of eternity with him. And so you got to ask, is it well with your soul? Are you ready to approach the table to partake in it? We're going to have a word of prayer and help prepare you for that and then Take time. As you're prepared, then come and take. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this opportunity, for this uh, memorial that we have to commemorate the act that you did for us. Father, that uh, you came, you showed us how to live, you lived that perfect life, and then you gave that life for us. And this morning we... We don't take that lightly, Father, we, uh, we remember it and we, we thank you for it and we just pray that we are somehow, some way, some shape prepared for it. Father, we just pray that you'll just bless our lives, that you'll strengthen us through it. Father, we thank you for your sacrifice and we just thank you for your love for us. Now we celebrate that. We pray all this in your son's name.
now we celebrate our ability in life that we have, that we make a living, that we uh, have talents and abilities that God has given us to, to use in this life, and we celebrate now giving back to Him a portion of that which He has blessed us with. And so, each week I tell you, God loves a cheerful giver, and He does. He loves us to give and to not give begrudgingly, but to give willingly, that knowing that that money is going to go towards His kingdom. His group here, the missions that we share, there's different people in life that need Jesus. And so as we give, we, we reach out to those. So uh, give joyfully and give freely. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the talents, the abilities, just everything that you've given to us that, Father, we can uh, make a living, that we can supply some of the needs of our life. And Father, we know that you supply all that for us and that you've given us so much and now it's our turn to return a portion of that to you that your kingdom, your kingdom can grow, your kingdom can flourish, that other people can be reached with you. Father, we just pray that you'll bless the monies, bless the gifts that are given. May they go to the work that you have set before us to do. And Father, may it reach those who need you. Father, bless the gift, bless the giver. We pray this in your Son's name. I mean, 
My daughter called, and it was 93 when she went to work, and it was 48 when she left. I mean, anyone else? Did you feel that this week? <laughs> so uh, it was interesting to watch uh, over the weekend all the different people uh, get ready for football games and, and tailgate parties. Uh, Kentucky Christian University had their big homecoming this weekend and everything. And I always send them up gator meat so they cook those and have it and do different things. And, uh, you know, they sent some pictures back, and I was just like, wow. I mean, stocking caps and, and not jackets, but coats and sweaters and sweatshirts and something. I said, what's the temperature? 46. 46 there in the mountains. And I was just like, oh. You know my words, right? Yes. Oh, I wish. You know, you dream those days? Fall happened this week, and so I thought, okay. Maybe we can find something in the scriptures that talks about seasons um, and things that go on. And, and the place that we always go, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, you know, it says there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. And, and we always kind of go there and read that and, and different things like that. And I said, there's got to be something more. I found the more found the more. It's actually back in the, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 8. And in Genesis chapter 8, what's happening here is um, uh, Noah has built an ark. He has floated in the ark. Mankind has been destroyed. Everything is, uh, is, is new. Land is breaking forth again. And the ark comes to rest. And the, uh, Noah and his family have gotten off God is speaking and then God is going to make a promise to Noah. And in chapter 8, verse, uh, we'll start with verse 20. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Now, verse 22, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. God makes a promise. As long as it exists, there's going to be seasons. There's going to be land. And I'll never destroy it again the way I did. I'll never destroy all the animals again the way I did. Things are going to exist and go on. And we know that from the beginning, it was God's plan for us to live forever with Him in the garden. We know that. We know in the beginning, Adam and Eve sin, and because of that sin, we get booted from the uh, garden. Man has to toil with the land. Women has pain and, and childbearing, and, and those things come with it, and it has been that way ever since. In this story, God had gotten fed up. He said, man has become so wicked, I'm going to wipe him from the face of the earth. But Noah, Noah, a man who found favor with God, who's going to build a boat, who got his sons to uh, help out. It was because of Noah, not his sons, that God spared man. And through sparing man and coming to this point, he makes a promise then that he'll not destroy it again, that he'll, he'll not do these things, and that as long as there is time, there's going to be seasons. There's going to be things that you notice. Now, the seasons seem to contrast each other. Have you noticed that? I mean, winter and summer. They're both the same. They're a season. And yet they're so different. Summer is that time that we look forward to, that we get to run around and do different things. There's no school and stuff like that. And the kids are out and, and we enjoy it. Unless... 
it becomes harsh. Anyone ever spent a harsh summer? Yeah. Heat, humidity, drought, different things that take place that it, it just becomes. And winter, winter, sometimes people think, oh, winter. You know, shovel snow, ice, terrible roads. And we don't have that down here. We just, just pretend, okay? <laughs> pretend we have terrible roads. But we just think of those things. I mean, I have a brother who says, I can't wait to retire. I'm moving to Florida. I'm selling my snowblower. What do you think? I mean, he just thinks when he comes to Florida, no snow. Well, that's true, no snow, you know. But this week we have a storm of brewing. You know, not sure where it's going to go or what it's going to happen with it. We, we just got to watch it. Gonna be, um, have you noticed the, the two different type of people? Yeah. Have you, have you know, I mean, there's some of us who... <clears throat> I see the lines at the gas station. I, I just pass it on by. I, I, I'll get it later. We still got five days. So. When I was looking, I said, we still got five. Are these people not going to drive for the next five days? <laughs> just going to fill up and they're, they're, they're hunkered in. And, you know. I, had, I had a guy, I, I spoke to him at Home Depot yesterday. I went to get a tarp to cover Dawn's Jeep that's sitting out in the weather. And, and, uh, I got the last tarp, and while I was there, there's this guy that has like 50 sheets of plywood, and I'm thinking, you're, you're plywooding up a whole condo or something, and he asked me, oh, hey, you've been through this before? Yep. yep, several times. He's okay, so the wood, when I put it up, I just... I cover everything. He was going to cover the entire outside of his house <laughs> with plywood. He had 50 sheets of it. And I said, um, no, typically what we do is you're going to cut it to the size of the window and fit it in. I said, I said over here you look and there's these hurricane clamps you put on the wood and when you shove it in, it, it'll lock in. It'll, and he's like, so I don't, I was doing the same, I could have a hard time talking about it, not laughing. I don't cover the whole house. Why? You know, and, and it's his first one. I mean, he was, he was literally panicked, not knowing, and, and, and we talked for a little while and got him squared out. He decided he could put back about 40 sheets of plywood. <laughs> he said, I said, I said, I said, how many windows do you have? And he went, every size? I said, ah, I got 10 windows. Okay. So at the most, you're going to need 10 sheets. If they're small and you use a half a sheet on two windows, then, you know, I said, you have to figure that out. And he said, well, I didn't measure anything. Well, just be safe and buy 10 sheets. But you don't need 50. And if you know the price of those things today, I mean, he was getting ready to spend a fortune. And, and he didn't just have sheets of plywood. He had tarps for his roof that didn't have any problems yet. But he was going to tarp his roof because he heard that people tarp their roofs. Um, I mean, it was just... Wouldn't have been a tarp I really thought, I really thought this. I thought... Early. I didn't think that my first time. Surely I didn't do that. But but there are people who didn't know it. And the season has really got them rattled that he said, I've never been in a hurricane season. It is a season. We don't have winter here and stuff like that other thing. We we got we got we got two two times a season, hurricane season and tourist season. And, and, and we deal with those type things. But they're in contrast. Sometimes winters can be very harsh and summer's nice, and sometimes summers are harsh and winters are nice. It, it just depends. We use spring. Spring is the time that we think of what? 
planting and fresh and new life and, and, and the seeds starting to grow and do, do different things. It's when the snow melts and the tulips start growing. <laughs> you know, up north. Those things. I mean, it's just it's just that way. But today I want to talk to you about seasons of things and contrast that God has made in certain things of seasons. Um, you know, he made he made it so that there were changes in life and yet permanent things in life. What things do you see that are permanent? Well, just from that verse, the seasons are permanent. They're going to be here as long as there's life on the earth. Until Jesus comes back, they're going to be here. And yet, they change. I mean, it's not just me, is it? I think, I think winter goes later, starts later, and ends later. I mean, when I was growing up, we never around Chicago had snow in May. In the past three years, they've had snow in May. It's like, it's like the whole shift of seasons starts happening. I mean, we normally have a lot of our hurricanes in, in July and August, and now they don't even really start forming until this time of year, September and October. You know, and you start seeing the things where things change. Even though seasons are permanent, things change in amongst them. Death and rebirth. We've seen things die. I mean, come to my house right now. I had that speed bump in the road a couple weeks ago. And uh, people have said, is there anything we can do for you? Man, come to my house. I have pine trees. Pine trees everywhere. What do the pine trees tell you right now? The seasons are changing. If you come to my house, the roofs of the house and the pole barns and the, are just covered in pine needles. Well, sooner or later. <laughs> but meanwhile, they clog all the gutters and they run over. And they, I mean, it's just one of those things. The, the seasons, the death of, of things, and yet you see the rebirth of others. It's funny that when the when the pine needles are falling off the pine trees, the oak trees have a new birth. <laughs> You notice that? You have oak yeah. trees in your yard too? I mean, those things are there. And then when the pine trees are getting their needles back, the oak trees are going to start throwing their acorns and everything all over the place. I mean, it's just it's just the season. It's the way they go. I mean, I have turkeys in my front yard. And you want to see something. I mean, their rear ends look horrible right now. Their feathers have all fallen out and just, it's that time of season. Molting. It, it's it's because of the time of year. It's the season that it is that they do that. They molt and do all kinds of So right now they look they look bad. <laughs> but they'll get pretty again. It'll just yes. happen. It just does their thing. Just the you know? all <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> they'll get pretty again just in time for uh, holidays to hit. <laughs> Two of them, Christmas and Thanksgiving. Kindness and severity. The Apostle Paul reminded believers in Rome to note the kindness as well as severity of God, Romans 11.22. Indeed, a faithful view of God will always take into an account both the love and justice that prosper through Him. I mean, we can't downplay it. God is a God of love, and yet God is a just God who is going to judge each of us according to us. I, I mean, it, it's just that way. I mean, I have people say all the time, well, a loving God surely wouldn't send someone to hell. Do you know what my answer is to that? He doesn't. You choose it. it it's your choice. A loving God wants to love you and have you in heaven with Him, but He, let, he allows you to choose it. Some of us choose to have our judgment end up being hell. I mean, it's our choice, right? We're not forced. I mean, I'm going to force you to live in heaven for eternity. Don't punish me like that. You know? 
Uh, and let me choose, let me choose hell if I want it. God says, okay. But you have to understand that there's a difference in them. The kindnesses and the love that he has and the severity of what that's going to be based on our choice. We're going to choose that season of life. I mean, and that season is going to last how long? Forever. For an eternity. And we don't comprehend eternity. We don't comprehend what it is. We just are like, yeah, yeah, it's going to... No. Forever. This, Scripture says, is like a blink of an eye. Forever. Try to fathom that. You know, we think this was a long time. I mean, I mean, we think 60, 70, 80 years is a long time. Go back to the Old Testament. Look at some of those. 600 years? 900 years? I mean, look at how long some of them lived. We're living shorter and shorter lifespan than what was there. I mean, when you take into it, in the garden, we were meant to live forever. We were meant to walk and talk with God forever. Because of sin, life has an end to it. And life just continues to seem like it gets shorter and shorter as life goes on. We think it's 80, 80 years. Whew. Boy, if I could make 80 years. I used to think I'd make 90 or something. Man, I'd be happy right now with 80. We don't know. We have no idea. I realize it could end like this. It can be done and over. And what's going to matter is the choices you make in these seasons of life. I mean, I, I, I know I was born in the spring of life. Life was good. I mean, gosh, we ran around. and We lived in a time when as long as the sun was up, we had whatever we wanted to do all day. I mean, our rule was when the street light comes on, you come home. And sometimes we got to stay out beyond that. If we, if we had a ball game, we were at the ballpark, and we might not be done until 10 o'clock, and then we got to stay out late. We thought that was neat riding our bikes at 10 o'clock at night on the way home. You know, do no sense. But can you do that today? No. Do you dare let your little kids go out the front door and not see them again until it's dark? You know, I knew the squeak of my dad's truck. It was loud. He'd come down the road. <laughs> when you heard the squeak of the truck, you knew this. It was dinner time. When dad got home, dinner was on the table, it was time to eat, we ran to the house. We ran to the house, we ate as fast as we could so that we could run back out so that we could be out until the street lights came on. We had to talk to mom and dad sometimes. We've got to stay out past street lights. For what? Lightning bugs. It's the only time we catch lightning bugs is when it's dark. You know? And on that rare occasion, we'd have that Friday night or something that we'd get to stay out a little bit later so we'd catch some lightning bugs. You know, and you take those and you shake them up so they're light, and you put them in the freezer. Come on, you guys never did that? <laughs> Fill the jar full of them, shake them up, and their lights go on, put them in the freezer, and their lights stay on, and you got like a little flashlight. You can walk around. <laughs> you never did that. Oh my God. None of you have lived. None of, none of you have lived a life. I mean, until you had a lightning bug flashlight. Oh gosh. We'd take them and put them under, underneath our blankets in bed, and we'd lit it up. It's really cool. We'll have to do that. We'll have to do that sometime this summer. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the Bible talks about abundance and need. I mean, I'm going to say something and it's going to sound really weird. But 
I understand the word abundance, I'm not too sure I understand the word need. I mean, I have been I have been blessed all my life that I don't know that I've ever had a need. When there appeared to be something, my it was like it was either there or mom and dad supplied it. Or there, there was never seemed to be a need. Was there want? Sure. But there was always abundance. When we sat down on a table, that there was mom and dad and the six kids. I mean, there was always enough food for all of us, and even our friends that we brought in the door with us. There was always an abundance. It was just, it was just the way that life seemed to be. And, and it wasn't, I mean, I'm not talking steak and lobster and shrimp. I'm talking, you know, hamburger casserole. And and different things like that, meatloaf and things like that that were were the staples of, of our eating. And I mean, gosh, we thought it was special on that night that we got those little frozen pot pies. <laughs> Life was good. You know, we're doing something. And our, and our friends would come in and get a pot pie and they'd be like, oh yeah. You know, we never have these at our house. Well, come by here and I'll, you'll see them. You know? And just those different things. Abundance. With God, there's an abundance. An abundance of love, an abundance of ability, and a bunch of, I mean, how many of you don't know abundance? I mean, we just went through an offering time to give back out of our abundance. I mean, I, I say this all the time, and I mean it. I am so richly blessed, I don't deserve half of what I have. But God. God in His abundance has, has given and taken care of it so we can do it in things for others. I mean, I don't have the thought, boy, if I had $10,000, I, I could get this. I don't think that way. But man, if I had $10,000, the people you could bless, the people you could help, and stuff like that, that's, that's the way my mind works. You know, and things that we could do to, to for others out of abundance. But I do know that there are those in this world that need. I do know the word need when it comes to others and stuff like that. It wasn't ever really for me, but for others there's that need, that, that thing that they need to, to make it to the next week or to the next day or to the, you know. Jacob has a friend that had a, had a bad car wreck this weekend. He has a need. He has a need of a machine to keep running that his lungs can heal from the flames and the fire and stuff that he can uh, breathe again. You know, he got the call on, I think, Thursday or Friday that his lungs stopped working and that they had to do something special. There's a need there. I've never had that need. But I can understand the need that he has. There's people in life with all kinds of situations that have a need for things. We're building a surgery center. We're not just building a surgery center to have a surgery center. We're building a surgery center because someone has a need for an operation. Someone has a need to have something physical done so that they can see the spiritual. And our prayers with that surgery center is that they'll see Jesus through the physical repairs that are going to happen. That they'll learn about this Jesus that can change their lives and, and give them abundance in their life. Beyond what they know. And so we build it. And we're going to send it. You know, uh, I told you last week, if, you, if you're not uh, in tune with that, the, the, the surgery center is up at my back gate of our house. It's there. Today the doors are wide open. Uh, Glenn and well, Glenn and Drew have taken a break to be here in church today, but they're going to go right back there and they're going to be working and building and, and constructing that thing. And 
We told you if you want to help be a part of that, man, all you got to do is show up. If you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is give from your abundance. If you want to be a part of it, pray. Pray that the work gets done. Pray that we have enough money to get the work done. Pray that the other people that are coming and be a part of it can do their part, that, that we can afford to do what needs to be done, that this center can become a reality and that lives will be changed because of it. That Jesus will be glorified through it. I mean, I mean, there's a season that that's going to be out there and working and, and I mean, that's going to be an extension of us there. Doing those works. Unity and diversity. Man, you want to see unity, unity and diversity? Jesus. <clears throat> you see, we in unity you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who mesh together, who, who mold together to make one. Who in unity become one that, that have changed the world. No other person, no other, no other thing other than God can do what has been done through them. I mean, read the Bible. Read the story from the beginning through Revelation. Read, read it and see what, what has taken place in, in lives of people to get to where we are today. Because of God, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Unity. Diversity, that middle part, Jesus. Jesus, who is fully God and yet became fully human. Who in a season of his life left his home and the throne in heaven to come here to the earth for us. Sent by his Father who loved us so much that he sent his Son and sent his Son into this world knowing what we would do to him. And I like to look back. I, I like to look back and say, man, look what they did. No. I'm a sinner. Look what I've done. If I'm a sinner... He hung on the cross before me. If I'm a sinner, it was my sins that hung him on that cross. Once and for all, he did that. To make a difference in our lives. Unity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and yet Jesus becoming human, being separated out of that, be totally human and totally God, I mean, how? see, our, our goal as humans is to become like Jesus, right? Our, our goal is to take on his characteristics and his things and become like him. How easy is that done? I mean, Rich, you, you mastered it? You got it, Rich? What? You, you've mastered it? You're, you're, you're like Jesus? Oh, no. No. John, if you're, you're like Jesus, you... Is there anybody here that has mastered that, has taken it on? And Calvin? No? I mean, that's the goal, correct? It's not easy. It's not simple. It's, it's not something that... I, I really don't know if we can do the same. I really like to think that we can. I mean, I see Enoch, who, who, who was so much in favor with God that God came down and walked them to heaven. I mean, so we know that they could be done at that point. And that, but man, to be like Jesus. Diversity, isn't it? It's that struggle in life between the world and God. Here we are in the middle, trying our best to do what he'd have us to do and, and to live the life that he'd have us to live. And yet, um, I fail. I mean, Gary, you ever fail? I mean, we just do. 
whether on purpose or, or, or accident, we fail. That diversity between God and, and the world is so different, and there we're in the middle with that struggle, and it's going to be a struggle, but we can get more and more like Him. We can be more and more like Him and less and less like the world. We can be more like Him and make a difference in this world for Him. But it takes work. It takes getting out of the diversity and getting into the unity with God. And it seems like the older we get, the more we get along in our seasons of life, the easier it seems to get to be with God. Robin's shaking her head. It's like, yeah, it is. And I don't know why that is. I mean, maybe we're too busy feeling our oats when we're younger. I don't, I don't know what it is. But, but as we get older, it seems like it's more and more like, okay, we need to get in step with this and get it done. I'm going to tell you, it is no more important today than was yesterday that we get in step with God. Because we're not promised a tomorrow. We're not promised another minute past the one we're living right now. It can end in a heartbeat. And then eternity. And if we are not in unity with God, we're going to be in diversity with the Lord. Unity with God is heaven for an eternity. Diversity and struggling is, is hell for eternity. And what we're doing here is what decides it. Today might decide it for you. I mean, God put together 66 books, 66 different writings. It took over 1,500 years to put it together. It was put together in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. It was put together in a way that it could be understood. I don't know any other way to say this, and I put it in my notes and I circled it. But the dumbest of us could understand. I can open this book and I can read it and I can understand. And what I can't understand, the Spirit will reveal to me as I get along and, and, and learn and grow what it's all about. 66 books that will direct you from birth in this life to an eternity in heaven with God. If we will follow. If we'll take the instruction that's there and, and, and live it. If no matter what season of life we're in, we're in it. We digest it. We take it on. We, we start taking on the characteristics of not just Jesus, but God himself and, and those things that he's about. And then we start taking on characteristics that the Spirit starts to work in us and through us. And then the Spirit starts working in us and through us to teach others. And it doesn't matter what season of life you're in, God will use you. God will direct you and teach you. You just have to be willing to be used. Another thought. How many of you like to be used? That's a, that's a misnomer life, isn't it? Being used, I don't want to be used. I don't want to. But yet I have to be willing to be used by God to make a difference in life and the kingdom. Willing to be used to be different for his cause. 
Read the 66 books. Jesus was different. Jesus wasn't like all the other people. He upset the carp so much because he was so different that the only thing they could think was, let's get rid of him. He's causing enough people in our system, in our religious system, and everything, let's just kill him and get rid of him. Now, I'm going to guarantee you something. A month ago, when I had my heart attack, and I died, by the end of this year, you all would have moved on. What? Got a new minister. Maybe went and got a new church. Changed life and did different things. But I'm not saying you wouldn't think every now and then, hey, good guy, terrible guy, whatever it is you think about me. But he would move on. They killed him a little over 2,000 years ago, and we still talk about it every day. We still think about it every day. We celebrate it every week when we come to the table to remember that, that life that he gave for us. They thought by getting rid of him, they'd get rid of him. They didn't know by getting rid of him, they'd make him the most popular being in the world. You see, it backfired on him. And here we are today talking about him and him in the seasons of our life that we could use to teach others. And it's our job. It's what we do. Every one of us are given the thing to go ye therefore in all the world teaching, preaching, and baptizing. I mean, we have to make a difference in this world for Him. No matter what season of life you're in. You see, at 61, I've entered the winter of my life. First 20 years, I was spring. Second 20 years, I was summer. Third 20, I was in fall. And now here I am. Look. No one <laughs> It's just part of it. Where are you? Where are you in what season of life? And where are you in the life with Christ? Are you able to be used by Him? Are you able to be used to make a difference in this world because of Him, in His kingdom because of Him? For Him. Because of him. That's what he wants. He wants you to take wherever you are in life and use it for him, because of him, for his kingdom, to make a difference. I mean, I pray that every day that my life makes a difference and that people come to know Christ because of it, and, and that's great. And beyond my death, you don't need to remember me. Remember what I was about. Him. About Him. And giving Him and teaching about Him. Because that's the thing that gets you to there. To there. Our goal. Heaven. So look at your life today. What season are you? What is it that you have that is going for you that, that you can use for Him? I mean, I look around this room and there is different talents in this room and different abilities that He's given to people to do different things. And we've got to use that in His kingdom for Him. We've got to use that here in this church for Him. That we can make a difference here in our small little part of the kingdom to reach out there to the world to help bring them into the kingdom. And we've got to help in the county, in the world, and the different things that we're part of. That's why we do missions. To reach beyond us to others. To teach Christ in all things. Is that your life? Can't get the one song out of my head. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. And it is well. It is well with my soul. 
I'm at a point in life where if Jesus comes today, great. If he doesn't, great. He'll be here soon enough. But I know that when he comes, or when my life ends, I'll be with him. I'll be with him in heaven. Him and my him and him on the throne and me just there, worshiping and honoring him. I have no doubts in my life about that. What about you? What about you? Are you ready to meet him? Do you have without a doubt know that you'd be with him in heaven from this day on if it ended today? And if not, you have some work to do in your life to get to that point that you can say, I'm Lord Jesus. So we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. It's your opportunity for you to look at your life, to uh, search out and figure out what season you're in and see where you are with Him. And do you have the characteristics of Him? And do you have the life of Him and the diversity and the unity and just everything about Him? Do you have it in you? And then are you sharing it with us? We're going to stand and sing, and if you have a decision to make, whether it's the first time for Christ or the third time to renew your life in Him, do that as we stand and as we sing. Uh. <laughs>
you so much that uh, we can come as we are. Uh, there is nothing we've done that's too bad that you can't forgive. Father, we just ask that you just uh, love us, that you take us, that you heal us, that you use us in your life to reach others for you. Father, guide us this week. Help us to uh, be in front of those that need you, that we're not ashamed to talk and tell them about you. Father, guide us, bless us, strengthen us. We pray all this in your son's name.